Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Um, we have with us tonight two distinguished gentlemen. We have um, Mr. Cedric T. You are um, international economic, economics professor here at the Graduate Institute. Good evening to you. Good evening. Good evening. And I have uh, also with us tonight Mr. Rodrigo Saez Munoz. You are a TV producer. You are based in, in New York. You have studied here at the Graduate Institute. Good evening to you. Good evening. My first question to both of you will be, what is your opinion of this movie that we have just seen now? Shall we start with you, uh, Mr. Saez Munoz? As a historian, <laughs> I think it's a fantastic piece of uh, documentary um, that takes advantage of a period in time that is iconic for Chile and for the Latin American region, and I, I'm probably far beyond. Um, they were fortunate that they were able to interact with, the, in, with the economists mm -hmm. that played such an important role and obtain a valuable footage from them uh, at a time when um, a significant portion of the Chilean population um, is willing to the Chilean population is no longer living in in fear and is able to express itself and its discontent Okay. Professor T. Yes, uh, a couple of points. Uh, first, um, one thing I think is important and comes through the, the movie is the importance when you do economics of thinking as uh, mechanics and not philosophers. Uh, what I mean by that is the key word in, a, in the business is uh, evidence and pragmatism. And what was, came very strongly is tendency to see oh, the free market is good period. Well, it is good. But you have a long list of conditions on what is required for it to work, and it's important to always confront things to evidence, and we have more and more uh, data. So you cannot just assume that because you give freedom, it's everything going to be fine and dandy. There are conditions under which it works. But this said, it's also important to bear in mind that you, know, you don't want to take the other side and say, oh, uh, the market doesn't do anything good. I mean, Competition is, is tough, but a uh, centralized control economy, we've tried that a few times. The results are an absolute disaster. Take any country that tries centralized uh, management, it's a country of emigration massively, and it's quite clear so. Um, one thing that disappointed me in the movie is a solid little economics. We told a lot about uh, the political uh, situation. Fair. We never taught, we taught what were the measures they took. Uh, so it remains very vague to me. Now, preparing a bit for the debate, and I'm by no means a specialist of Chile, far from it, but uh, doing some uh, searching, what we found is liberalization of international trade. There is plenty of evidence that as a country to grow, this helps a lot. Look at Southeast Asia, look at Korea. Uh, liberalization of international capital flow, not so fast. There's plenty of uh, look in economics of whether that works. The answer is kind of, but you have to be very careful how you do it. Uh, and even if you look at IMF uh, papers on that, uh, they're very clear. Um, liberalization of uh, more broadly. So for instance, independent central banking. Okay, well I was a former, I work as an economist at the, the Fed, so it's, I'm a former central banker. But that works well. If you, if you uh, say that the central bank has a job, is price stability, and that's it, this is a key for success. You get low inflation, and always bear in mind, inflation is one of the most socially horrible taxes. It's a tax that hits the poor most. Yeah. Um, no, it's rough. When uh, you, do, you have to break the back of inflation, this is never pretty. See Paul Volcker, United States, 1980s. That's what. Uh, so I was a bit disappointed that there was a very little discussion about what concretely did these guys do. And one last thought uh, about uh, the BRICS. So the movie is quite ironic when they prepare this report. And that thing that was a bit unfair to this guy. You know, there's an extent of naivete of them that's very clearly there, fair. But if you're an economist in a country which has profound economic problems, and your view is to stay, leave me in my office tower, I don't want to be any part of it, you're shocking your job. Okay, you have to go and try, do your best to try to think. 
Will you uh, get some things wrong? You bet you will. There's no way you produce a document that thick and get everything right. But it's your job, you try. So I think uh, even though it looks the like quite naive exposed, the fact that confronted with a disaster, economic disaster, these guys say, okay, what do we know? What can we do about this? That was a duty as academics. Do you share the views of Professor T, Mr. Yeah. Saez Munoz? I do share his evaluation, but you have to take into consideration that this documentary, and it is one of the weaknesses in my opinion, is that it was geared for a Chilean audience, an audience that is very much in touch with the history of the 1962 to 2015, a, an audience that when um, Mr. Fontaine says the middle class is doing really well in Chile, would have simply laughed because the Chilean middle class is at the verge of being bankrupt at the end of every month. So it's a very precarious situation. Um, the film, also has another weakness in, in its focus on the Chilean identity and the recognition of its problems. Uh, perhaps it is difficult for non-Chileans to realize that uh, what are these protests about? Between 2011 and 2015, um, they, they mentioned that over a thousand um, marches took place. But what, are, what is it about? What are they angry? They are angry about speculation education. They are angry um, that the promises that the neoliberal model makes that you'll be able to retire with dignity uh, was a chimera at, in the best of cases. And these are the problems that the current uh, administration needs to deal with. And unfortunately, it is a very difficult process to do when you are, have to deal with a democratic process when there are alternative opinions to be listened to, something that the Chicago Boys never had to do. Before giving the floor to the audience, because I'm sure that uh, you ladies and gentlemen, you have a lot of questions. Um, may I ask you, Professor Till, do you think that this um, Chicago Boys model was a success or not? from an economic point of view? And then I will ask you from a social point of view. Well then again, tell me what the model is about. Uh, I, I, I'm just saying, you know, you have to seek a seekable view, but what is this view? Uh, I mean, economy is my, my first reaction when the debate, are you, uh, you know, pro this or pro that? Mm -hmm. There's one thing I, I don't like is isms, you know, liberalism, communism, or whatever isms you want to put. Mm -hmm. I'm a pragmatic guy. I want to see what is the problem you're after, where the, the friction, what can I do? And sometimes I will end up uh, agreeing with policies that look leftist, sometimes that's more to the right, uh, you know, which always this uh, journalist puzzle was interviewing <laughs> because I never quite know where I stand. But that's what the job is about. Uh, I view myself again more, much more as a mechanic than, than a philosopher. So with that in mind, um, look at data, so just looking before this, um, this movie on some uh, data on GDP and inflation, the standard things of macroeconomists, Chile didn't do well at all in the 70s and 80s if you compare with other Latin American countries, it wasn't that great. Things really picked up in the late 80s, uh, which is many things toward the end uh, of this. Uh, so by and large, now if you ask, let me pick some ingredients. So if you say, well, leave people the freedoms to, uh, to compete, yes, yeah, that works well. Monopolies don't work well. Uh, so open to trade, that works well. I mean, if this, we live in Switzerland, this country would be dirt poor if we couldn't trade with the rest of the world. Um, other things, liberalization, careful. And the market does not do everything well, and to understand that, you, when you present to students, you know, why is free competition a good thing? Here are the 10 conditions under which it happens. Uh, no dominant position of any actors, uh, complete information, and on. And for instance, to pick complete information, that's why when you look at healthcare, you have to be careful. It's a very asymmetric information there. So by and, um, by and large, I would say yes, but I, I, oh, I never want to say, oh, this is a model that's great, meaning the other are wrong. It's always kind of a, you know, shade and gray, and this piece works, that piece was easy. And I think one thing that is important, um, as an economist, that's something I picked from Central Bank. At some level, if you're a policy maker, you have to be paranoid. You have to always think, what is the thing I haven't seen that is going to blow up? Uh, and as you always have, if you think everything is great, start worrying, because that means you, you miss something. And the movie, what struck me, a lot of these guys, 
when they say, well, didn't you know this was going on? Not a clue. Well, either maybe you're lying, but if you tell the truth, that's even worse, because you, it means that you were not at all um, opening your ear and getting the intelligence to, to see what actually was going on. And as a policymaker, that's a huge fault. What do you think of uh, this uh, success or not success? Yes, but being paranoid, we didn't know about that, as uh, one of uh, the gentlemen said. I happen to agree with the professor. Uh, there is no black and white. Mm -hmm. There were tremendous mistakes made by the Frey administration, by the Agenda administration, and by the Pinochet government. Um, Chile from 1940 onwards is the poster child of statism. Uh, Pinochet overthrows Allende, at a time when the Chilean economy is around th hovering around 350, 370% inflation rate. Uh, the, the initial instinct on the part of uh, Pinochet is to bring in status policies, along with the Chicago boys. Therefore, the economy is given over to a engineer by the name of Raul Saez, no family. Um, and Chile tries statism. The economy continues to spiral out of control, principally for, due to external factors such as the oil shock and the, the very low prices of copper to the point where the economy is about to pull apart the dictatorship. And Pinochet is about to fall off, fall off power and he turns to the Chicago boys as a Hail Mary pass. Um, and it was successful for Pinochet. The period between 76 and 1982, there's significant growth, uh, inflation is stabilized, and as Sergio de Castro said, the, um, the oligarchy will have to assume responsibility for its profits and its losses. But in 1982, well, Chile goes bankrupt, the private debts that the oligarchy had assumed in purchasing all of the privatized companies suddenly became public. Again, not exactly a traditional neoliberal economies. And on the, person, on, on the human level, it's a lost generation. It is uh, people that learn to live with fear, not only on the economic front, but also on, on the personal front. Uh, you could not sit at a dining table unless you belong to the, those who were part of the military junta and not have a conversation about, son, you don't repeat what is said at the table. Uh, fear was ingrained into a generation of Chileans. And these children who are out uh, marching and uh, venting their anger is the first generation of Chileans after four decades who can live and express themselves freely. Um, Quite achievement. Thank you. If you agree, gentlemen, can we give the floor to the audience? Uh, we have uh, 35 minutes. I'm looking at you, uh, Mrs. Cote. Is it all right? 35 minutes? Okay, so we'll have uh, as many questions as possible, which means that your question will be brief. Thank you very much. Who wants to ask the first question? Do I see? Yes. Can I have, yes, the mics? Yes, the gentleman there? Exactly, there. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'll then go briefly. Um, I wanted to ask you about the relationship between neoliberalism and imperialism. There's a recent book by an American intellectual historian, Queen Slobodian, called Globalism, which he traces how, well, neoliberalism at its beginnings in the 30s, even in the Graduate Institute, began as an attempt to reconstruct imperial relationships in a world that was no longer feasible to have colonies. And I think it's very interesting that Rodrigo mentions copper. The movie makes it seem like this was about chickens and cigarettes, but at the end of the day, we all know this was about agenda's privatization of copper and American interest in that privatization. So how does this uh, discussion about Chile relate to broader issues about economical and especially American imperialism? Well, I don't know if there was isms in the Graduate Institute that never gave me the memo when I joined. <laughs> no. And more seriously, 
I'm always look very careful about this grand planning and grand links. Again, I tend to be a much more down to earth uh, applied guy. Uh, if I want to dominate countries, the last thing I want to do is make them rich, uh, because there they would, you know, start uh, having uh, outside uh, options. Now, far from me to say that you know uh, Uncle Sam has always been the most benevolent place on uh, actor on earth, uh, but but neither was the, uh, was the other guy. So that there you have power plays in international relations, of course. Um, is the fact that if we market a particular way to do that, I'm, I'm very much skeptical, frankly. Would you like to add something? In regards to the neoliberals movement as a part of US government policy with the Chicago School, um, other countries also receive scholars, someone from Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Venezuela, but only in Chile were the, was the Chicago School able, through military dictatorships, achieve uh, the imposition of its model. In Argentina and Uruguay, it was also tried in Argentina during the Rodrigo's uh, uh, dictatorships, but it was a failure simply because the nexus between the oligarchy and the military in these other countries was very strong, while in Chile, there was a very significant differentiation between the military class and the oligarchy. One thing, if I may follow up, so we talked a lot about Chicago. Uh, it's a school where people have a, have a clear uh, type view, but it should also be in mind, this is really a school that produced a lot of heavy heaters in economics and you know, and are really uh, major contributors. The second thing, there's always, Chicago it was not the only school that got heavily involved in uh, international economic policy making. Thinking of MIT with uh, the, uh, Rudy Dornbusch, uh, with a connection with Ashuri, by the way, um, the Stan Fishers, were guys who went to, uh, a lot to the IMF. If you tell these guys they're Chicago boys, they would not take it keenly. So there was a lot of very different angles. Uh, you know, the kind of Boston type is much, much more, uh, much more careful in saying, "Oh, markets are great." Period. They will, yeah, they're good, but hold on, you know, uh, trust but verify and frame the thing. But, but if I may, yeah. uh, why then uh, does this expression "Chicago boys"? remains and, and is so important because when we think of Chile today, mm -hmm. we are thinking of Salvador Allende, Golpe, and Chicago boys. So why, how do you explain that? Well, one thing, one thing you cannot accuse them of is being shy. Uh, so it was a clear program and they say, let's, you know, let's go full force in breaking. And, and again, so here I'm, I'm going a bit on the limb because I don't know Chile that well, but if you're in a country where you know, there was a long tradition of, of state control or, or monopolies control, and you get to a period uh, where you basically have penuries, um, lack, lack of food, this is a time says like we got to be bold and try something else. Maybe it's not a time to frame that. So play at the hedges. So there was like a, a sharp uh, move there, which explained. Um, other uh, emerging countries also got a lot of these pressures. They tended to get it more coming from the IMF. So you could, you could always say it was a new idea. It's you know, the boys from Washington who imposed it uh, on you. But in the end, it, the, the main recipes were, were fairly similar. So I don't think, maybe Chile was a bit uh, one of the first mover. Other country, emerging country kind of moved later on to that. That may explain why the expression talk. Plus, it's good marketing. OK. Next question, please. Yes. The mic, please, here. Thank you. Everybody talks about the rise of populism. Do you see any area currently in the world where liberalism is gaining traction, A, B, where it has success, and C, do you see it as divergent or concurrent with democracy, like Singapore, for example, had at the same time a relatively authoritarian state and a relatively liberal uh, economic style? Okay, so uh, liberal, as liberalism work, well, you know, I reflect as an economist is give me the counterfactual. If I take the counterfactual of things that were much more control, I think the evidence is pretty clear. Uh, it doesn't work, it work doesn't mean it's perfect and it makes everyone happy. I want to be clear on that. Uh, the problem that we had was, uh, let's say, it went overboard. So if I take, for instance, a specific example, financial sector development, and you can see in the US, uh, you can see also in international capital flows, the liberalization went too far. 
so this, this is a sector that needs to, uh, to be framed, um, which wasn't enough, and that gives you waves of capital flowing in and out. Um, and it's a big thing now uh, in, uh, in the international economic policy making. Say, okay, how do you frame capital flow? How do you avoid this disruptive uh, movement to take? Um, there was a bit, say, of naivety in the sense of thinking, well, if you just liberalize, everybody will be happy. There were people left on the side. Uh, this was overlooked. Uh, the idea, I mean, if I take from the movie, when the person says, I care about poverty, not inequality, in a way, yes, I can see that. What matters is the absolute level. But then to go and say, well, why, why is it too, so dumb that they cannot see it? Like, no, because there is there is a very valid reasons uh, to protest, and the facts of saying that uh, of putting it that way means that you don't play a large fraction of the uh, population, which is then is going to feel resentment, and that's how you get the populism. Even though the populists in question, when you look at the actual policies, then don't benefit at all the per the people who are revolting. Would you like to comment uh, on, um, on that? the Chilean and the Chilean case? Um, the rise of populism uh, and the explanation for why the Chicago model continues outside also because it has been successful is that until 2005, the democracy was very much under control with lifelong senators who were appointed by the military or from sectors of society that were considered to be loyal. Um, Beyond that, I think people have a realistic expectation that not everything can be free. Uh, people are asking simply that the laws are, um, are followed. And if you take a look at the model of the Chicago Boys, in Chile, a small country at the time of 10 million, today 17 million, the growth of monopolies have created severe problems for the Chicago Boys because it is their children who are profiting tremendously from having an inside road. Uh, I also, if for a moment I suspend my disbelief that someone as brilliant as Sergio de Castro did not know what was going on, you also have to take into, into consideration Chilean society, which is extremely segregated. Chile is one of the most classist countries in Latin America. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of politicians and major members of the oligarchy went to three schools not three universities, three kindergartens. And they, there you find the relationship, the networks that permit people to succeed, which it's sad because in a sense, the, the experiment that Castro wanted to create a level playing field where merit arose to the top never occurred. And why? Uh, because we give jobs to our friends in Spanish, we call the pituto. Mm -hmm. We may not be corrupt in terms of we ask for payment, but we make sure that we surround ourselves with the children of our friends uh, and such, which creates ter terrible distortions in the system. Even when uh, you had um, socialist presidents uh, in Chile, did, did, did you notice any change or no matter who is uh, the president of Chile, this situation continues. It's an ingrained aspect of the culture. Unfortunately, Madame Bachelet, uh, Mr. Lagos, uh, President Alwyn, and Mr. Frey continue to follow these uh, policies. But it's, it's understandable. They want to know that they tr can trust and rely upon the person who they've given a duty. At least this is how Chileans think. And they don't want to hire someone who may come and, and stab you in the back. Therefore, when you go to a meeting with Chileans, they still ask you, so where did you go to school? Because this is the first piece of information that lets them put you in a box. And where you are living also, in which uh, you know, surrounding. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe to, to follow yes. on that, so again, I, I, don't, I don't know Chilean society, so I'll, I'll follow there. If the problem is that you are so segregated, whether you take you know, liberal policy or not, it's not going to change that. So I think it's important um, to, to see if, if you have a problem that leads to protest. Is it because they took a Chicago-type liberal view, or is it because the country has a fundamental problem of segregation? Uh, and it sounds to me that the problem is way more deeply rooted than which orientation of economic policy you put on top of it. Absolutely. Let's take another question. Maybe from this side? No. 
so back to the left. Yeah. Okay, here. The mic. Um, I just want to talk, uh, comment on that. I think this problem of segregation comes from colonization, and uh, and Chicago Boys seems to be like an, a, a, a remedy, a bad remedy. But um, I think, uh, as the question before, the film doesn't address that there was a, a, a need to extract um, um, materias primas at a lower cost, and then this is just one measure more that, again, is not working. That's my comment. I don't know what is the question. And <laughs> Mr. Saez Munoz, what do you think? Uh, certainly the colonial experience of Chile, perhaps the, the poorest colony uh, in the Spanish kingdom, a colony that was in constant war uh, until independence came, and then the pacification taking place a good 50 years after independence. Um, it's a society where 15 families that received a portion of the country continue to be the dominant families in business. Um, it, is, it is very difficult to, to break away from a mindset of knowing your place. Um, and that is an, it's a part of Chilean culture, Chilean society, that I think new generations are breaking away from. But it's still, uh, the higher up you go, the, who you are is determined by your last name. Okay, thank you. Let's take another question. Yeah, uh, here and here. Okay, let's start with you, gentlemen, and then another question there. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to go back to um, the period of the military dictatorship. And um, one comment from one of the Chicago boys really struck. Um, and, it, and he went, these are the costs that are necessary, referring to the human rights violations, mm -hmm. um, if we want to make any sort of um, advancement. Um, and obviously, Chile, it, uh, uh, Chile has moved away from a dictatorship to democracy where, you know, you, you can't really think of governance in that kind of logic anymore. But in many parts of the world, um, that is how things are run. Um, and that sort of relates back to the comment that Professor Thiel made about the role of a economist in the government. So I just wanted to um, push a bit further on that and sort of ask about your opinion on, you know, what kind of role or um, how does, what do you consider as a legitimate um, role that an economist can play in a government that's not necessarily, you know, democratic, but, you know, needs these intellectuals who design the big pictures, but then in a way that, you know, balance different uh, within the boundary. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, so to do economic policy like trade liberalization or, you know, uh, independent central bank, there is absolutely no need to machine gun down people. So the stuff like, oh, we, you know, the human rights were necessary, that's poor. Uh, that's just totally wrong. You can perfectly do a sound economic policy, and you, know, the, you may have to engineer a recession, it's not going to be fun, but you don't need to send the army in the street, so I don't buy that excuse at all. Um, your role in the government, well, uh, so the point where you have to bring uh, your ex technical expertise and try to do best. And then if you're in a government that, that looks like that, well, at some point you have to face your conscience, uh, look in the mirror and uh, ask uh, what you do. And it, and it can be a tough thing because it's not like everything's fine and boom, suddenly you have a huge revelation that it's wrong. Yeah, it's usually, okay, you, you accept a little bit, then a little bit more, then a little bit more. Um, and it's hard, I mean, when we see that, uh, of course, the gentleman who says, oh, I had no clue, that, yeah, come on. But then, say, if I had been in his shoes, in his concern, would have I seen uh, faster than he did? I don't know. You know so, so I think the key aspect there, when, you, when you're part of a group and say, okay, I don't like what they do, but 
I can do my part that is right. Uh, you, you have to crave discomfort. I think it's, it's important to, to constantly question yourself and have I crossed the line. And there is no easy way to do that. There is no big, blatant red line that you have to, uh, to contact. The day you start thinking, no, oh, everything's fine, you go in denial, that's when it's dangerous. So to do your job right, you have to live, I think, in a very big, a big state of always being questioning you, uh, yourself. Uh, now, here it's blatant because you have human rights violation. But say if you work in an economic policy and you say, uh, we're going to liberalize the retirement fund, privatize it. And then you say, well, okay, but this start having inefficiency and it's starting to affect some people wrong. You have to say, Am I, have I gone too far? Uh, have I done something wrong? Okay. So what, one message I like to give my students is as long as you uh, wake up and, and say, I don't like the way the world go goes, it's good. Because it means you haven't lost your, uh, your, your questioning sense. What you should not do is say, oh, you know, the world is just horrible and just want to move out of here. I would like to have your reaction, sir. But to follow up on the question of this gentleman, there is the question also of the armed forces in Chile, who were supposed to be very loyal. There was a tradition, uh, isn't it? Uh, at least that's what we heard, uh, that the uh, army was loyal. And then suddenly you have a coup d'etat, and then suddenly you have... Um, this violence, torture, suffering, murders. How can we explain that? I am not a Pinochet scholar, but I would argue that there's a certain headiness that comes with power and with near absolute power as the military in Chile had in 19, September 11th. 1973, uh, when you take a look at experiments done at UCLA, where you divide students into uh, prisoners and prison guards, uh, things get out of control very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think Pinochet initially, whether he was pro-coup or against the coup, I, I don't know. I uh, haven't done enough research. But it is certain that he, and the, the 10th of September when he's told to either uh, be part of the coup d'etat or face the possibility of a civil war, uh, he opted for, um, for joining the coup d'etat and eventually gathering all of the power of the junta is in, in his own hands. In 1973 through 75, the junta plays a collegial role. Uh, Pinochet is one amongst four. Uh, he does not have absolute power. And, and the initial debate within the military junta is, are we here to replace the government and bring usher in a new administration? Or are we here to refound the very basis of the nation? And this is where the Chicago boys come in and play an important role. Um, 73 through early 75, Chile continues on the same path. The Christian Democratic Party, the center, the, the political center of Chile, is tepidly supports Pinochet until 75 when they come to realize a couple of things. One, from information from the church, the level of human rights abuses is, cannot be condoned. Second, they realize that power is not going to be turned over to them uh, quickly, and at the same time, the Pinochet consolidates power over the other elements within the junta. And that is when the Chicago boys are given free reign, when uh, faced with 345% approximately uh, inflation rate, uh, Pinochet gambles, and he gambles success successfully. And some military were against the coup d'etat. Some of them have been killed afterwards. Correct. Uh, General Prats was assassinated. Um, there were purges within the military starting from September 11th onwards. Uh, sailors and ships were executed and thrown into the ocean. And yesterday, the ex-head of the um, military, General Chede, uh, who was a young lieutenant, saw the execution 
of 15 uh, soldiers as well as civilians in a small city in the north of Chile. There was a question here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I haven't got a question, but I have a comment, which is that uh, I'd like to propose that the narrative of the film is, um, it, it's not the correct one. I, I'm not a Chilean specialist, but I read the narrative of the film as being um, the measures which they took have been successful over the long term. Um, Chile was like Cuba, and now it's very, very rich. But it's been successful, but it was brutal. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I think the narrative of the film is. But I'd like to propose that the, uh, that's the wrong narrative, that the, 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 the model um, wasn't successful, and that the, you know, the, 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 there are two aspects of that, which is that um, the most successful examples of economic development are in East Asia. And they work with a developmental state which kind of animates the private sector. They don't ignore the private sector, but they work with a developmental state which animates the private sector. Now, I think, uh, uh, so the Korea is the example of that. So if you compare Korea with Chile, Chile isn't at the level of Korea. So it's not the successful one. Now, I don't know the Chilean example very closely, but one of the things I noticed was that the film was sponsored by Corfo. And as I understand it, Corfo is a state entity which is trying to um, use government money to promote new innovative activities like foreign films. So the, the elements of success which there might have been in Chile might well have depended on state-related activities. So what I'm suggesting is that the, the film gives the wrong impression. It's successful but brutal. But the narrative should be that this model is not the most successful model which we see. It, it has had some success. It squeezed the inflation out of the economy, but it hasn't been as successful as others. Okay, let me, let me react to that. Uh, so first, you can be successful without being brutal. Uh, again, as pointed before, you, you don't have to send the army in the street to tame inflation. Um, and again, but if you take the comparison with Cuba, I mean, it's, it's blatant. Uh, was a Which country sees people living by any, any means they can? Uh, can you protest in Cuba? I don't know. But going to the example of, of Korea, and here that goes to my point of saying, okay, what specifically was the policies we're talking about? Korea or the Asian tigers are very clear. You, you hook yourself to world export markets. You do an export-oriented economy. Uh, you bring foreign capital to uh, foreign direct investment to, to promote uh, local knowledge. Sometimes you bring foreign hot bank flows and that doesn't work too well, okay? And it's totally true in Korea, the state played a role, but here it's important that to understand that you're playing a game in two steps. If I start very low, and to catch up, what I have to do is essentially imitate the other guy and learn from him. So I kind of have a state that you know, makes uh, all the chicken in a row and we go and do that. Once I get close to catching up, then I have to go to the second stage, say I have to start innovating myself and be creative. And there having big states for an entity is actually turning against you. So you can play, the state can be like a fostering the innovation at first, but then you need to give the témoin the, to the other guy. And if you look, for instance, the development of the internet, uh, basically at the basis, it, it owed a lot to the US Department of Defense. Uh, but then once uh, all the internet-based companies rose, then there was the state had no role in that. Would you like to react to this comment? One of the failures of the film in its international va version is that you can't read the, um, the signs that the students are carrying. You can't understand the song by Anna Tijoux uh, that is criticizing 
the type of society that, that Chile has built. So um, perhaps you get that impression because you, a, a portion, the visual portion, is missing for you. But it's, it's highly critical of the Chilean model. And uh, maybe it, it's saying that it has failed the majority of the population. We have five minutes. We can take two questions, one from our right and one from our left. Who wants to? Yes. <laughs> or even three. Yes, madam. Um, I was struck by the, the, how the, one of the Chicago boys dismissed the idea of uh, equality and inequality as something that doesn't count politically or economically, but it's more, he looks more at poverty as a value. And I, you know, learning for also from the Arab Springs uh, and from like now the World Bank is uh, putting out a report where they actually stress uh, the political risk uh, of society that have strong inequality inside uh, created by an economic system that creates inequality. What's the role of, uh, what's the value or not of equality in uh, the liberalism nowadays? Okay, so inequality is, uh, is a big topic uh, of research. Uh, to follow on the, the comment there, I would say, I'm not bothered there are rich people in the world. I'm bothered there are poor people. Uh, and so, that, so what is, matters is the key standard of living. What I think that that gentleman failed to realize is inequality can be accepted if it's seen as being uh, not coming from an unfair practice. One of the strongest emotions uh, among humans is being given a fair deal. So if you say, you know, we, we all start and someone goes way better than the other, it's like, okay, the folks work hard, or we, we had, you know, a, a, uh, the same chances, a fair, and good, good luck for him or her and not for the other, that is acceptable. If you say, no, uh, the, the fellow going ahead because he's from the right family or he cheated uh, in any way, that's where you get a problem. And I think the inequality problem comes a lot, and to a large extent rightly so, from the sense that, hey, we have uh, you know, people who gamble in financial markets or whatever, and they went ahead, and we stuck with the bill. So there is something that this guy pulled uh, something unfair on us. And that is, I think, where the rub really is coming. If you have differences, say, okay, he's ahead of me, but that's because of his hard work, and I'm doing well anyway compared to what my parents did, I can live with that. Would you like to add something on poverty, equality, values? I think since we have about three minutes left and we have quite a few hands up, why don't okay, we... Okay, let's go to the left then. Uh, professor, um, earlier you seemed to disregard the idea that the United States was involved in overthrowing Allende and installing a leader who would be more amenable to uh, our domestic interests, in this case, um, uh, trade deals in favor of co or more favorable trade deals for copper and other natural resources. Um, but the thing is, we do have a historic record to show that that was the case, that that was the United States' economic, or sorry, the United States' foreign policy in Latin America in the 1970s and 80s. And I just wanted to clarify if you think that this policy of what is essentially um, economic imperialism is able to be divorced from neoliberalism as it's understood. First of all, I never said the U.S. has nothing to do with overthrowing Allende, let's be clear. Uh, no, the dirty tricks in the Cold War, yes, and both sides did it. Uh, the, uh, no, it's, it's, there's more than one villain in the story. Um, to say that uh, uh, the free market economy is nothing but kind of a Trojan horse for domination from the U.S., I disagree. Uh, sorry, there, there is evidence, uh, economic evidence, that it actually it works. I mean, it's not perfect, nothing is. Uh, you can you find any system, uh, system or any model in the world, you will find things that don't work. But the question is always, what is your alternative? Okay. It's a bad system, yes, all the other are, are worse. Uh, so so there, is, there is an element that we, we push our interest and we play dirty tricks. Yes, of course, that's how international relations work to a large extent. It, uh, it doesn't mean that the, the, the ideas I push are totally value, uh, worthless. They have something worse in it. You can have someone, someone with the worst of intention say things that are right sometimes. In defense of the Chicago boys, uh, copper is nationalized in Chile under Allende, and under Frey they begin 
the redistribution of the land. The Chicago Boys did not touch either one of those two policies. I look at uh, Mrs. Jacqueline Cote. Do we have time for <laughs> one last question? <laughs> yes? Okay. All right. Yes? Yes, sir? Okay, let's take two questions. Quick, quick questions, please. No, a quick comment uh, on what has, following on from what has been there. Some time ago, uh, the same platform talked about Indonesia, then about the Palestinians, today about Chile. Speaking from the flow board of the developing countries, who is to be held accountable for all this? I mean, you know, the nice little theories that came about and then caused such devastation. The Cambodian Pol Pots were held accountable. Should there be an economic tribun tribunal which will hold these people accountable for all the chaos that caused? Uh, Mr. Saez Muno said, four decades of students didn't talk because they were covered, intimidated by the army. A willing accomplice of all this was the economic Chicago boys. They go free. Kissinger said, we must save Chile, although they voted for Allende. He still appears on television and makes great statements. Who should hold them accountable? I propose that the International Graduate Institute of Geneva have an economic tribune, tribunal to judge these people. <laughs> the, the economics profession is full of tribunals. They're called conferences and seminars. Trust me. <laughs> if you go there, it, the, the idea that all economists are all on the same line, totally uh, far from the truth. Uh, no, the tribunal judge criminal uh, intentions. Making an economic policy that turns out to be wrong uh, point me a scientist that never got anything wrong. Uh, that just doesn't exist. What is important is to have contrarian voices. So if there's one thing you can criticize, and we should to this guy, is to say they were in a bubble. There was no contrarian voice, uh, but they're the far from the only uh, economies that operated in bubbles. Unfortunately, that's human nature, and it comes in across all stripe of ideology. Next one, the last question, because the question you ask, sir, is uh, for a next panel for Mrs. Uh, Jacqueline Cote, I'm sure. So, yes, yes madam. Yes. I, I just wanted to like, jump maybe on that idea. How do you, because the concept of culture came very strongly to me, being a Chilean, I completely understand the, all these things that being said. I mean, what, he, what the sir over there was pointing out, that this was brutal but successful, that is something that we have very ingrained in our system. Like, at least in my perspective that I think that I'm not very biased, I would say it was a dictatorship that helped in the economic. We would have never had the country that we have today if it wasn't for that moment in time. But the cost of it was really hard, was really high. But then how can you deal with a prosperous economy or the development of a country if those bubbles are never bursted? And within this culture that I don't know if history can give us more into than that entail, is keeps fostering for year for year. Like how can you explain that after 20, 30 years from this debacle, you have 20 year olds, 15 year olds still taking sides and saying my general Pinochet and being left or right and we're highly divided and how can economy play a fundamental role when culture is so much more predominant and the bubbles are never bursted? Like how can we have a, I don't know, a political or economical approach to that and make something better because the damage is already done and there's nothing else to be done, but we can only construct from here, right? Do you, could you like, I don't know, have a, an enlightenment between culture and economics? And okay, culture? so a short one. Uh, I think it's important to bear in mind what economics can and cannot do. Uh, our job is about trying to get associate, um, allocate resources efficiently. I'm very skeptical that we can do much about the culture. If a country, for whatever historical reason, is split in a way, uh, this is not something economists are going to be able to do much about, I'm afraid. The last word is for you. Education. That's why you're here. Exactly. So when you go back to Chile, you know, Look at both perspectives, share it with 
your colleagues. If you happen to work, to live in, in Las Condes, talk to your neighbors about it. Um, more than that, you can't do. But over time, hopefully, a truth that is acceptable to both sides will emerge. I don't see that happening in, in my generation, perhaps uh, in your children's. Well, what I suggest, if you have appreciated the film, I suggest you come to the festival Filmar en America Latina. We will be there until the 2nd of December. You will see uh, many very interesting movies coming from many Latin American countries. You will have the possibility to meet also with directors, both men and women. The director of the festival, Vania Ayon, will be there. Uh, as, and also the president of uh, the festival, Jean-Pierre Gontard. So I would like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I would like to thank you, Professor Thiel, and thank Pleasure. you, Rodrigo, and thank you, the Graduate Institute. Have a nice evening. Thank you.